This is Changing Channels with Larry Walsh, the Channelnomics podcast that connects you with channel chiefs, thought leaders, and executives about what it takes to get the next generation of tech to market. Here's your host, Larry Walsh, the CEO and Chief Analyst of Channelnomics. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Changing Channels. I'm your host, Larry Walsh. Channelnomics, we are change agents of sorts. When vendors come to us, it's because they feel that they either need to change their programs to adapt to changing market conditions, or they need to keep up with competition. It's easy to say that you want change, but achieving change is never easy. You know, if you're already having some level of success, that can breed complacency. If you're already getting results, then why do you have to change? Um, Culture plays a lot into it as well. An obstacle that stands in the way of progress and improvement is the existing cultures of many organizations. We we see it all the time at Channelnomics. Um, good ideas die in the vine because channel teams will say, well, that's just not the way we do it. Another inhibitor is institutional thinking. Many channel leaders and teams find themselves following best practices or how somebody else did it. They believe the safest route forward is the one that's already established and well-worn. Questioning the status quo, continuously looking to improve and find new and innovative ways of addressing indirect go-to-market capabilities takes drive, innovation, and dare I say, courage. Now, one company that has done a fantastic job of questioning the status quo, uncovering problems and solving them, and innovating their channel programs is Palo Alto Networks. Of all the companies I work with, I can say without reservation, the channel people at Palo Alto Networks bring me the most complex and interesting questions. They are constantly trying to figure out better ways of creating value for their partners and customers, simplifying processes, and driving results. That type of introspective to outwork change isn't easy. So I thought it would be worth exploring how it's done. And for this episode of Changing Channels, we have one of the chief drivers of the pursuit of continuous improvement at Palo Alto, Carl Sutherland, who recently changed roles from Palo Alto's Senior Vice President of Worldwide Sales, Channel Sales, to take on the new role of Senior Vice President of North American Ecosystems. I've known Carl for a long time. He's a great guy. He's held several channel executive positions, including Vice President of Worldwide Channels and Alliances at Imperva, Vice President of Worldwide Channel and Alliances at Aruba Networks, which is now part of HPE, Vice President of American Channel Sales and U.S. Channel Sales at Avaya. And, you know, he was the America's VP and General Manager of Sales and Marketing for HP's ProCurve. That's their old networking line that's now under HPE. And he was Senior Vice President of America Sales and Global Alliances at Fortinet. Carl is a true channel veteran and a tireless channel advocate. So with that, welcome to Changing Channels, Carl Sutherland. Thanks, Larry. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for making the time for me. Oh, no. Look, I've been wanting to get you on for a while. This is a great topic for us to talk about. But before we get into talking about driving change or effective change, uh, I want to talk about the big news coming out of uh, your world, which is uh, you have a new title and a new role at Palo Alto. What, you know, tell us a little bit about this new ecosystem role you have. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, as you know, Larry, I've been with Palo Alto Networks for six years now. The majority of that time I've been in the global team, driving the strategy, responsible for the program, looking for consistency on a global basis. And what I like to say is that was a role of influence. I work with the leaders. I work with the partners. I influence the, the environment and where we're going in the direction of the company. I was asked to, and it's been under preparation for probably about four or five months now, kind of making this transition, to go into the North American spot, leading the ecosystems. And I'll explain what that is in a second. But the driver is really going from position of influence, from position of execution. Now, you know, I own the number. 95% of our business touches one of our partners going in the process. So uh, I'm excited to kind of get back in that operator role and kind of grow that. Well, you know, Carl, I, I look, I'm on record about this when it comes to ecosystem. I find ecosystem in the channel context a tortured word. It means a lot of things to different people. I, I, as I've said, people may have seen the video I did on this where I said, of course, I believe in ecosystems. The channel was built on it six decades ago. It's not a new concept. But what is the what is ecosystems to Palo Alto and what's the significance to you and your partners? Yeah, it's not a new concept. It's just an, it's a different vocabulary world to explain it if you really think about it. So when we think about our partner community, I really could take a step back and I put myself in an end user standpoint. An end user wants to have 
flexibility, flexibility in how they consume technology, flexibility in how they support that technology, flexibility with who they trust and engage with. And that comes in you know, the different form factors. It can be a global system integrator. It can be a solution provider. It can be a uh, service provider. It can be a CSP, cloud service provider, a managed service provider, distribution. And all of them play different roles and add different value. And I think what, you know, historically, you know, our business has tried to do is put everyone into a square box saying, this is your swim lane. This is what your role is. And the reality is there's a lot of crossing of intersections right now. And we need to be flexible and open-minded enough to support all of them. And they continue to change. So what we're trying to do at Palo Alto Networks is really open it up to look at it saying, we've got a flexible baseline to work with our, with our partners to support our end users in the best means possible. So Palo Alto is actually in the process of consolidating a number of its channel activities and programs under your next wave program. Uh, is your change in role to ecosystem part of this consolidation? And what's driving, what is actually you're doing with this consolidation? What's the driving force behind it? Yeah, I would, I would tweak one thing, Larry. I would never say the word consolidation. It's more of a unification. Okay. So we're taking some disparate programs that were out there and we're bringing them together. And again, it's the same breath. So you know, is it part of my transition? I think it's just, it's a natural transition either for myself or my peers around the globe to be able to have that alignment with the partner community to satisfy the end user's needs. So what we've done is we've have five paths now um, for our partners. It's a services only path. It's a solution provider path. It's a MSSP path, a CSP path and distrib distribution path. And although that sounds like a lot, the reality is, there's a lot of gray area. What I mean by that is if you're in a large complex Fortune 100 deal, there may be a service provider in there selling, adding value. You may have a GSI who's, who's dictating the direction of the, of the customer and where he's going. And you may have a solution provider who fulfills this opportunity. And then you may have a managed service provider who does some management, all in the same deal, in the same account. Historically, we can only give credit or recognition to one partner. Well, who's the partner who added value? Well, in this case, there could be three or four partners that add value. So by pulling this and unifying this program together, we're able to recognize the effort and the value, although maybe different from all our different partner uh, routes to market. Right. Your colleague and, and our old friend, Lang Tibbles, I, yes. it, and if nobody, if you don't know who Lang is, he, he is truly a salt of the earth guy who's been around the channel for a long time. He said in CRN about the about this unification. Uh, correct my correct my language there, Carl. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, Palo Alto needs to build a partner program that allows partners to come along on our journey. This is about the future, and he goes on to talk about exactly what you're saying: the bringing together the the resources and the enablement that comes with partners that are multifaceted. But at the same time. We also hear a lot about the need for specializations, that vendors need mm -hmm. to help partners specialize and differentiate in the market. Your unification sounds a little bit almost like it implies homogenization, homogeniz implying homogenization. Um, mm -hmm. So how does that play when you're also trying to build out a larger ecosystem to enable this, where you have a lot of specialized interest, but you also, and a creative interest that comes with ecosystem plays, when you're also trying to bring in this unified approach towards addressing your partners? Yeah, Larry, that's a great question. And I think to try to break it down to its simplest terms, you know, we may have multiple routes to market, which we need to support independently on how they're structured with us. And that may be with how we compensate them. That may be with how we cover them and manage and support them. But then the other cross section of that is comes down to, with how they support the end user. And that comes down to the specialization. The specialization, in, in my opinion today, is really a practice that's about a technology or service that you're offering and how we enable the partners to get you know, enabled and, and, and the capabilities and skill set for them to be successful. So again, if we think about a multi-layered approach, the foundation of the program is the routes to market. And then layered on top of that is going to be you know, the specializations based on the different technologies and giving our partners choice on where they want to invest, where they think they have the bench of skills, where they want to, you know, grow their business and alignment. Because 
one of the things that I've been really thinking about is we don't want to come out with a new program every year. That just confuses the partner community. We want to really have a foundation that we can build off of and grow and allow that flexibility. And that's what we're trying to do with the same sense being in, in, amazingly critical of ourselves saying it cannot be complex to the partners or the external community. And I've seen some multi-billion dollar companies when they roll out a partner program, it's 300 pages long and you need a PhD to understand the math. So now we're trying to constantly be critical and saying, we're going to come out with an elegant program at scale, which is simple to understand and simple to leverage. Right. All right. So everyone, you heard it here. Carl Sutherland says channel programs should not involve math. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> simple math. Simple math. You know, or is, you know, what did somebody say to me once? Channel programs should be like San Jose state math. Is that keep it that there simple? You go. Yeah. I would never say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, folks, as, as I mentioned in the intro, we have been working with Palo Alto for a few years, and, and Carl's been an inspiration for a number of things that we do here at Chalonomics. And it's been a really good interaction, back and forth interaction between our two organizations. Um, one of the things that's, and the reason why I even have you on for this podcast is because the the drive of change and continuous improvement that you do, you and your team do for Palo Alto. Uh, one of the things you said in the announcement of the of the change that uh, that's being implemented, you told Channel Futures, uh, and this is, I believe, is a quote, uh, we always put pressure on ourselves and stress in the system to make sure that we are bringing the best solutions and opportunities for our partners. And the next wave program for threat response is one of those. So it's a constant drumbeat that we bring to market. And again, mm -hmm. here's the crux. You've been around the channel for a long time, and it's easy for veterans to rely on old playbooks, apply the same game, uh, game plans that they've used in the past. And, and I don't mean to speak derogatory towards anyone or imply that, but I mean, you and I have both seen people just move the ball forward a little bit and call and say they won and they and claim success. Yet you and the Palo Alto team, you're dutiful in this challenging of the status quo. And I've seen you put pressure on yourselves to challenge conventional wisdom and your own convictions. You know, what does it take to actually put that kind of pressure on yourselves? How do you create this culture uh, to not be comfortable with accepting what could be an acceptable solution? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Larry. And I think it's multifaceted. I think the first side of it is we need to listen first and act second. So I, it's this has been part of my culture that I've been driving this company the last six years is get out to the partners and listen to what their needs are, try to understand the market, understand their challenges, and then see how we can solve them. And then as we listen to them and we bring it back, surrounding yourself with a team that where you can have healthy debates. And you've been on those calls, Larry, where we don't agree with each other and we hash it out and we respect each other that we bring different views and insights into the market that we can hash it out and, ha and just determine what the best play is. And then the last piece of it that I think about quite often is I think so many people who are in channel leadership roles are afraid to fail because there's been a lot of turnover. And oh God, if I make this mistake, my CRO, my CEO will, will send me off to greener pastures. You have to go in aggressive and be ready to fail. And if you fail, act quickly and, and recover. And so if you can get a track record of knowing that you can be aggressive in the marketplace, you can make changes, you're listening to the partners, it, you'll be successful. And, you know, the example is when I roll out any changes to the partner program, I open it up the same way every time. I say, I have the honor of representing what you have shared with us as your needs in the marketplace. And all we do is we, we collaborate and we pull it all together into a single statement and are able to kind of deliver that. And that's allowed us to be successful and continually challenge ourselves. Well, you may have just answered part of the next thing I wanted to ask you, which is where does this inspiration come from? Is it truly that the organization, the stakeholders in the field, uh, the partners or the customers, that they are the ones that are coming to you directly with the challenges that you need to make on yourselves? Or are you out there persistently coming up and asking whether or not you could do things differently, you can make improvements, you can yeah. you can draw from experience and do better. Where's where's the inspiration for change? I think the inspiration to change is the exact same inspiration of why I left being a high touch field leader and committed myself to channel roles the rest of my career. And that is the excitement and the creativity of 
being able to see lift and leverage. I always give the analogy saying, I'm like Oz behind the curtains. I've got all these levers and buttons to push that can change the go-to-market strategy and change the outcome of the companies that I'm supporting or working for. And if you are in a high-touch sales role, you either grow by increasing the productivity of the team you have or cutting up territory in half and adding more resources. And that playbook is kind of the same playbook for every technology known to man. But when we talk about the ecosystems and we talk about the, the elegance of the routes to market and the different value that they bring, that's the exciting part about being on this side of the house. We can drive up our valuations and change the stock price by some of the things that we can implement. And you need to go in there energized and excited every day to do things differently. Because if you talk about relying on your old playbook, cybersecurity may be different because it constantly changes. Forget about quarterly or monthly, it could be weekly or hourly that we always have to look at the market dynamics and see what happens and how we can actually improve. So surround yourself with a team that thinks in a similar fashion that enjoys the change. You know, John Chambers used to say the only constant is change. Consider to hold yourself accountable to make moves and be aggressive with it. And don't be afraid to fail. Not being afraid to fail is, is a good, is a good position to be in, but there's also culture that gets in your way. Like I see this frequently in working with channel teams at different com companies, particularly where you have an ingrained culture. And uh, let's take one of the stats that came out of your change announcements for Next Wave. Mm -hmm. So you reported that your managed security service provider program grew 146%. Yeah. It seems, seems pretty good as a standalone program. Mm -hmm. um, and we hear it all the time. Follow the data. Let the data be your guide. The data will help you identify problems, devise solutions, and make better decisions. Um, but if I see a number that says, hey, we're going 146%, what's the impetus to change? What is the motivation for it? You have somebody on the receiving end of this conversation to accept that a change is necessary. What do you need to do to get them to the line and then over it? Yeah, um, I think that when you say follow the data, there's a lot of data to look at. So I'll use that example, growing at 146%, but the total addressable market is enormous. So I think we're just getting started to use, you know, American baseball terms, we're in the first inning of getting started with our, our success. I also, many times when I look at the numbers and especially for businesses that are, are uh, smaller and growing, that the percentage growth, I don't wanna see anymore. I wanna know the gross, the gross growth that we're driving towards that. Cause 146% is excellent, but there's no reason that shouldn't be 500%. And we always drive ourselves to do more. So I guess when you say, going back to the don't be afraid to fail, don't be afraid to win either. And don't be afraid to set aspirational targets because more times than not, if you have a good team and a good plan, you can blow through those numbers. And we've had that type of success. Yeah. Now, one of the things you and I were talking about coming on to this, on to this recording was talking, and you've said it several times, team. And you look, you have a pretty good track record here of of having a band that you've kept together. Mm -hmm. You've been in place. The average tenure of a of a channel chief is under three years. I see them come and go more frequently than that. Uh, but even within the teams, they're not exactly institutionalized. You channel mm -hmm. people move around quite a bit, and you have Tom Evans, who's coming in to fill your your previous role, Lang Tibble's running your programs, and I've had the pleasure of working with several people on your team that run more of the discrete uh, and directed programs, not only that, programs, but also distribution. Um, having What's the importance of having a like-minded team that isn't just filled with, less, and how do you fill it without just putting together a bunch of yes-men? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, the value is, or the reality is how I think about it, is a huge value to have a level of consistency with the team that you have. But in order to be successful in doing that, you need to really be focused on hiring the best and the brightest that you can, can support in your team and surround yourself with them. And then once you have them in, really invest in their careers, invest in what they like to do, put them in positions to be successful, give them the recognition that they need, challenge them and be consistent with how you manage them. I mean, I, I can say, Larry, you know, I'm not an easy manager to work for. I hold people accountable and I, and I push them to be better every day, but I'm consistent, right? And I think that's something that teams look for. So, you know, if I think about the team that is within the global organization that I, I'm transitioning away from, I think our average tenure is over five years on the, with the company. 
we think about our overall go-to-market organization globally, it's less than two years. So we've been able to keep some really strong people that have been able to really show results. And, and again, it's less about being like-minded. I think it's about having some core DNA traits that are similar. You know, are you competitive? Are you passionate about what you do? Are you a creative thinker? Do you like thinking out of the box? Are you, you know, playing offense with how you go about when you think about building the projects and where you're going to grow, go to. So, you know, having that level of consistency makes a difference. Now, I know that that's difficult for someone coming in and taking a new leadership role within the channel. I also think it's important to build the confidence of your senior management that you report to, whatever that reporting chain looks like, you know, being complete candid on what's working and what's not. I know sometimes I've seen my peers try to sell shun, sell sun. Let's try that again. <laughs> sell sunshine up through the organization. And the reality is that doesn't work. They want someone who's with a business mindset, who's thinking about the overall health and economics of the company and how to grow it. And that's how you, you gain that mindset. Well, I'm glad you said that because one of the things, a mistake I see some of your peers make is that they don't take internal selling seriously enough mm -hmm. when they're trying to, even if they have the right, uh, they've identified, they've correctly diagnosed the, the problems that need to be addressed. They come up with the right solutions. They fail to, to actually go through the process of selling the organization and particularly the different stakeholders that that are around that have say or at least influence you know my you know some people's heroes are are you know generals or you know some other sports stars like you know tom brady or larry bird um mine of course is peter drucker and you know he said it best culture eats strategy for breakfast yeah so what's the importance you know how do you overcome that those cultural barriers and what's the importance of internal marketing internal selling when you're trying to make changes well, it adds a level of collaboration, which equates to accountability. If I'm working with my CFO and collaborating and brainstorming and working through ideas, or I'm working through the CRO and having the same level of dialogue, what's going to happen if they agree and they collaborate, they're now accountable for that idea. So they're part of the team in going through this. I always use the term whistle stop tour, saying any changes that we need to make or enhancements that we're going to make, we go on a whistle stop tour. And we go to all the key constituents and we say, here's what we're thinking about. Here's what we'd like to do. Here's what we believe the end result's going to be and how we'll be able to drive it. And when you get that alignment, when the whatever announcement happens, when that announcement happens externally, when the internal executive chain, team reads it, it should be old news. Like we've been talking about this for months now. It's just a press release. So there should be no big reveal. Uh, I think you need to break down the barriers of us versus them. Us meaning the channel or ecosystem team versus them the sales team or the finance team or whatever it may be. It's you got to act as if you're in one team and you got to get as many constituents as possible pulling for you and how you're driving your business. And then it becomes, I don't want to say it becomes easy, but it becomes, you know, energizing and exciting because there's a lot of people driving towards it. But is it just, is it just relationships though? Or is it also the, the, from on high, from the executive, the executive leadership team on down that they enable this ability to try and fail or enable this, uh, this innovation of being able to at least ask the questions without consequence. Uh, I think the accountability is on us, to be honest, you, Larry, we got to, we got to control our own destiny. Don't look for a CEO who's going to enable you because of the ecosystem, because most CEOs across the industry realize they need a strong ecosystem. They're not exactly sure why, and I think understanding and showing the lift and leverage you can get and the capabilities you can bring to market and the scale and reach, they're on us. So we need to be accountable for that. Don't don't hold anyone else accountable for that. That's a really good point. All right. So I talk a lot about risk and risk mitigation in channel programs. Um, and there's a lot of risk that comes with change. And there's also risk that comes with complacency. So let's close with this. In your yeah. opinion, what's the risk of doing nothing? What's the risk of leaning too heavily on legacy thinking and and being complacent with whatever degrees of success you have today? Yeah, going back to your comment about let numbers dictate your strategy or be a big part of your strategy. You know, if I determine my appetite to change, it's really after doing heavy financial analysis on where it's at. So the risk of not changing, 
is that every market independent of where you're at has a number of competitors that are willing or that are doing nothing but gunning for you every day when they wake up. So if you're not changed, if you're not living in a world of paranoia, you're probably you're in the wrong role. I right. constantly wake up and the first thing I think about is I know there's 15 companies that are waking up saying, how do I beat Palo Alto Networks? So yeah. I need to be challenging myself that way. So that's the risk of not moving. Now, I actually think the world is over rotated some or the market's over rotated some. And I think there's a lot of change for change sake. I'm going to give a great example. Every channel leader who comes into a new company, what's the first thing they do? Hey, Larry, I need a new program. Help me build a new program. Why? Because I'm in a new role. I got to put my stamp on it. Not understanding, not looking at the analytics, not understanding the market. Things could be working swimmingly. You just don't know. So be thoughtful in your approach, make a decision and act quickly. And that's really our process here. Okay. And just for everybody's cl clarity here, he did not disabuse my my primary business model. Please keep calling. <laughs> <laughs> True. My apology. You had a huge value. That's why I'm here today, Larry. Absolutely. You're the best. No, so like seriously though, you're you're absolutely right though. I want to say there's the old joke that you know you're not paranoid if they're really out to get you. But that is the constant, isn't it? Is that the, it's the drumbeat the the drumbeat of change is not is not change for the sake of change, but is to make sure that you wake up the next morning knowing that you're going to have another day to go forward. Yeah, and it's changing because you want to change versus have to change. If you're too late and you have to change, you're digging yourself out of a hole. Yeah. I'd much rather be aggressive in trying to make those changes, knowing it's for the right reasons for the future. Yeah. Very good. Carl Sutherland, thank you for joining us here on Changing Channels. Carl Sutherland is the Senior Vice President of North American Ecosystems at Palo Alto Networks. Thanks, Larry. It's great being here. Thanks for the time. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode of Changing Channels. I want to thank our guests, again, Carl Sutherland, the Senior Vice President of Ecosystems North America for Palo Alto Networks. And I want to thank all of you for joining us here on Changing Channels. Technology is changing the world, and the Channelnomics, we're tracking how to make it all happen here in the channel. And we're going to keep doing that for you. If you like what we're doing, hit like, hit subscribe, tell your friends about us. Until next time, I'm Larry Walsh. Thank you for joining Changing Channels with Larry Walsh, a production of Channelnomics. If you've enjoyed today's episode, hit the like button, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and share with your friends. For more information about Channelnomics services and insights, follow us on Twitter and YouTube, and check out our website at channelnomics.com. Channelnomics is a registered trademark of, and Changing Channels is copyright by, 2112 Enterprises, LLC.